Well, as the Surgeon General of the United States, Vivek Murthy had certainly encountered a variety of medical problems. But after his term ended in 2017, he wrote an article for the Harvard Business Review reflecting back on his experience, and he said this, During my years caring for patients, the most common pathology I saw was not heart disease or diabetes, it was loneliness. Murthy, in fact, goes on to say that we're experiencing a loneliness epidemic in our culture today, and I'm sure that you have felt that in your own life, as I certainly have in mine. But what's happening in our society is that in our attempts to satisfy our longing for relational intimacy, we settle for shallow digital connectedness instead of deep, authentic relationships. We are, as the MIT sociologist Shelley Turkle says, alone together. Maybe you've seen one of the memes or maybe you've seen it in real life, a whole group of people who are all together, but they're all looking down at their phones together It it may look like community, but it's pseudo-community, and that's really a picture of our society today. And all of this has deeply shaped the way we think of Christian community, and it's left us with what I would consider a disembodied church. Here's what I mean. When it comes to faith, the norm in our culture today is a me-centered spirituality based on preference where the church exists as a dispenser of spiritual goods to prop up my individual relationship with God. And so with Jesus as my personal Savior, I can then tailor the faith to my liking. I can pick my favorite style of worship music and find a preacher that I connect with. I can get my favorite translation of the Bible, maybe even get a popular pastor's signature on it. I can pick a venue of my choice with just the right ambiance so that I can have my personal worship experience. And of course, community is usually one of the consumer goods that we include in our experience. But as long as it's within a me-centered spirituality, it's just a veneer of community. We're all just in the background of each other's selfies, even if it says hashtag blessed. And that's why actual relationships are reduced to an accessory in this kind of faith. See, we live in a digital world where tangible presence has been devalued. And that leads to a disembodied spirituality where you can go to church online, listen to the podcast of a sermon, stream your favorite worship album, and text your friends your prayer requests, all while sitting on your couch alone scrolling on your phone. And social media certainly plays a particular role in this. We all know that social media is not reality, but we play the game, right? You know, show the best, hide the rest. That's what we do on social media. And in doing so, we project an image of ourselves out there of what we want people to see us as. So uh, here's, here, yeah, here's the people, here's the kind of people I hang out with. Here's the kind of restaurants I eat at, my latte art. Here's my greatest accomplishments, usually shared through humble brags. But then what happens is we project these images of ourselves up, and the very images that we project end up becoming a barrier between us and authentic relationships. Because what if they actually find out what I'm really like? Maybe they won't stick around. So we hide behind our filters and become slaves to the false self we've put out there. Now, once again... In a disembodied culture, we need to look to the incarnate Christ and his vision for the church. And this morning, we looked at the embodied Christ in John chapter 1. Tonight, we're going to look at the embodied church in 1 John chapter 1. And by the time he pens this letter, John has become an old man. While all the other apostles were killed for their faith, John lived late in life. And so just think about this. He spends three years by Jesus' side. He witnesses the death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. And then after 50 years of living and teaching the way of Jesus, he settles down in his old age in Ephesus and taught the church how to love one another. Listen to what he says in 1 John in the first four verses. He says, That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifest to us. 
That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Now, right off the bat, I want you to notice how tangible the gospel is in the scriptures. We have heard, we have seen, we have touched. There's no room for disembodied spirituality here. And I love how at the end of his life, John is still glorying in the incarnation of Christ. This beautiful truth that reminds us that God is not a cold, distant deity up in heaven, arms folded, looking down on us with disappointment, waiting for us to get our act together so we can work ourselves to him. No. We believe because of the incarnation that God is the God who has pursued us in love, who has sent his son for us, who took on the flesh, who died for our sins, who rose from the grave. This is good news. See, the incarnation reveals that God is not the God who is out to get me. He's the God who is for me. But look back at verse 3 to see where John is going with this. He's not just talking about the incarnation here. He says, that which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you. Why? So that you too may have fellowship with us. The tangibility of Christ is going to play out in the type of community that they have as followers of Christ. In other words, the incarnate Christ is going to create an embodied church. And, and the two, Jesus and the church, are inseparable. Far too often, people think like this. Well, I meet Jesus, I'm saved. And, and then later on, like then the church is this secondary bonus to my relationship with God. But no, the church is not an afterthought to salvation. The church is not an extracurricular activity to following Jesus. The church is not an optional add-on for spirituality. The church is the community of the gospel and is absolutely indispensable to the Christian life. But remember here that I'm not just talking about the idea of the church. I'm talking about real people that are hard to love and that will let you down from time to time. See, everybody wants to find the perfect church, but I got to tell you, if you do find it, don't go there. You'll mess it up. Okay, because none of us are perfect, and we actually need each other and each other's messiness because part of our healing process is being a part of the healing process of someone else as well. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German theologian. He was one of the few that resisted the Nazi regime and stood up against Hitler. He was put in solitary confinement for that, and he once said this, The physical presence of other Christians is a source of incomparable joy and strength to the believer. Now, of course, our situation is different than his. But with the shallow digital connectedness in our age, we too need to hear his call to recognize that the physical presence of another believer is a gift from God and something that needs to be pursued. So I want to challenge you very practically speaking Put down your distraction device. Look people in the eye. Engage with people. Prioritize physical presence with people. Learn to Sabbath. And not just from work, but Sabbath from social media or maybe even technology. See meals as an opportunity for connection with people. Meals are actually a great example of of how things play out in a disembodied uh, culture that's obsessed with accomplishment. In our culture, we see, few, we see food as something that we consume in order to fuel our bodies so that we can go accomplish more. That's why we eat on the run. That's why we eat so fast. But we don't see food that way as Christians. Food is an opportunity for us to sit down and with every bite, taste and see that the Lord is good. With every swallow to remember that God has been gracious to us and provided us. To serve one another as we eat. To sit across from the table with someone and to laugh with them or to cry with them. To listen to them and to speak truth to them. What a practical opportunity that we have several times a day to live this embodied vision out. It's going to take this kind of discipline to build healthy relationships that endure in faithfulness. We need this, and and people have recognized recognized this around the world. There's uh, an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. 
See, we live in a culture where people want to go fast and be at the front of the pack alone. But we want to go far. And we got to stick together for that because endurance is a community project. It's a church project. There's a great evangelist named D.L. Moody from Chicago. And there's a great story of Moody uh, sitting down over a fire outside and, and engaging with someone in a debate about whether they needed to be a part of the church or not. And this gentleman was arguing with D.L. Moody saying, well, I can follow Jesus and not be a part of a church, and I can love God and I don't need to be a part of a church. And so they're sitting down over this fire and they're talking, and, and D.L. Moody is reasoning with him from the scriptures, and he's showing him texts that, show, that, that make it clear that that's not the case, and he's arguing theologically with him, and he's, he's explaining to him why that can't be, and the man resists and resists and resists, and he just won't listen to D.L. Moody on this. And so finally... D.L. Moody stops arguing, and he gets up, and he pulls a log out of the fire, and he throws it off by itself on the dirt. And the two men sit there quietly and watch. And while the fire rages on, the one solitary log that's by itself on the dirt quickly burns out. And he had clearly gotten his point across. We need the body of Christ to be united with Christ. We have been called to Christ and to his family, the church. And now I want to call you as boldly as I can to commit to the church and to commit to the local church. And here's why. I believe that the local church is the hope of the world. Now I know that that's an audacious claim. I know that people have done a lot of dumb things in the name of Jesus and that the church has a bad rap. But Jesus has not given up on the church. Jesus loves the church. Jesus pursued the church. Jesus died for the church. And Jesus made an unwavering promise when he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And ultimately, it's Jesus himself who is the hope of the world. But he's at work in and through the church, and he is keeping this promise of building his church in a grander way than you could realize right now. Let me just give you a, a little bit of a glimpse of how Jesus is building his church throughout the world right now. It's truly, the church is growing in unprecedented ways right now across the globe. Check this out. In 1910, there were only 8.7 million Christians in all of Africa. 8.7 million. Today, there are over 631 million Christians in Africa. In 1949, amen, praise God. In 1949, there were fewer than a million Christians in, t in China. Today, there are well over 58 million Protestant Christians in China. And even when they're persecuted, they keep growing faster and faster. I mean, Nigeria has more Protestants than Germany, the very birthplace of the Protestant Reformation, and Brazil has twice as many Catholics as Italy. And listen to this. The name of Jesus is being praised right now in 4,765 languages throughout the world, all over this globe. And, and if your jaw has not dropped yet at how quickly and amazingly Jesus is building his church, listen to this. It is estimated that 80,000 people become Christians every day throughout the world. 80,000 people. Can you imagine the party in heaven? Can you imagine the rejoicing of grace going all over the world? Jesus is building his church. And that's why I say that the local church is the hope of the world. Just think about this historically. Kingdoms rise and fall. Movements come and go. But the church of Jesus remains and is flourishing all over the world. And everyone wants to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Well, there's no movement that has brought more hope and peace than the movement of Jesus. So I boldly want to charge you today, and I'm going to call you to four actions. Commit to a local church instead of me-centered spirituality based on preference. Listen to your pastors instead of adoring celebrity pastors. Invest in embodied relationships instead of settling for digital connectedness. And embrace the mess instead of bailing when it gets hard. 
I know that there's a lot of commitment issues today. I know a lot of people have a fear of missing out. They don't want to commit to one thing because they will miss out on other things. But let me remind you that if you don't commit to anything, then you're committing to doing nothing with your life. And the king of the universe did not get slaughtered on the cross so that we could get things our way and have our own personal worship experience. He calls us to self-denial and to commit to his body, the church. And listen, when I say these things, I'm not down on social media. I'm not down on technology. Podcasts and worship albums and apps, they're all great as long as they're not a replacement for involvement in the local church and real actual relationships. See, listening to a podcast is not the same thing as sitting with the body of Christ under the preaching of the word of a pastor who's praying for you, feeling the spirit move in a corporate way, and not even just in that moment, but in what he's doing week to week in a local congregation. A worship album in your headphones is different than than gathering together with many different people from different backgrounds and lifting your voices together, we need to hear the different accents and the different octaves and the different uh, voices all as we sing and worship God together. We need that. I'll tell you this. There's no better picture of embodied spirituality than the Lord's Supper. You can't do that on an app. <laughs> You can't sign up online for that. And when Jesus wanted to share the meaning of his death, he didn't give a lecture, he served a meal. Can you imagine the sights and the smells and the sound and, of course, the taste in that lesson? Communion flies in the face of modern spirituality that's individual and disembodied and private. No, the Lord's Supper is communal, it's tangible, and it's public. So I'll close with this as I call you to commit to the church. Uh, A lot of people think of the church like a cruise ship. You ever been on a cruise ship? If you go on a cruise, then um, there's, what you'll see is that there's two groups of people on a cruise ship. There's a small group of people that do all the work. They're the employees, right? They, they make the food, and they change the sheets, and they clean the place up. Small group of people that do all the work. And then there's a large group of people who are just along for the ride. And they're just going to take in and consume and critique the performances. But they are just along for the ride while the small group of people does all the work. Well, a lot of people think of the church like a cruise ship. And they think that there's a small group of people who are supposed to do all the work. Maybe that's the pastors or maybe that's the leaders or maybe that's the, like, fanatic Christians. However they kind of put that, that there's a small group of people that do all the work. And then everyone else is just along for the ride to consume, to get fed, to critique the paid professionals from time to time. A lot of people think of the church that way. But let me tell you this. The church is not like a cruise ship. The church is like a battleship. And what happens on a battleship is there's not two groups, there's one group. Because everyone's got a job, everyone's got a role, and everyone's role matters, and everyone's working together. Why? Because they're in a battle, and they've been given a mission. And so the church is like a battleship, and we have all been called into this. We all need to commit. We all need to throw ourselves into this, committing to Christ and expressing our commitment to him in the church. Because we're in a battle. And the Lord Jesus is victorious, and he is accomplishing his purposes. He's building his church, but he draws us into that to show off the grace of his glory. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.